Hello and welcome to New Life Online, everyone. My name is Tom Pounder. I'm the online campus pastor here at New Life Christian Church. We're so glad that you're with us today. Hey, I do want to highlight a few things about New Life Online that makes us unique and makes us a great experience for you before the service actually gets started. The first thing I'd like to highlight is connection. We have two great ways that you can connect with other people today. The first way is to get in our chat room. This is an opportunity for you to get to know our chat hosts and actually other people from around the area and actually around the world as you get acclimated with what New Life is all about. So hop in the chat room right now and say hello and where you're watching from. But if that's a little bit too much for you, that's totally fine. We, we totally understand that. But I would strongly encourage you to fill out a connection card. If you go to newlife.church/connect, you can get, fill out this connection card, and then you can get to know New Life a little bit better. And then we can also get to know you. Again, it's a way that we can start connecting with each other, and so that you can feel more a part of New Life. But the second thing I want to highlight real quick is our prayer card. We believe in the power of prayer, and we believe that when we submit our request to God, God acts in some way. And so if you have a prayer request today, and you'd love for us to be praying with you and for you throughout the week, uh, go to newlife.church slash prayer. Again, we are so glad that you're with us today, and we hope you have a wonderful experience at New Life Online. I'm Barb Martinez, and I am the Connections Minister at New Life Christian Church, Linton Hall Campus. We're so glad that you're joining us today. If you or someone you know happens to live in the Gainesville, Bristow, or Haymarket area of Western Prince William County, we would love to have you join us for our in-person services at the Linton Hall Campus. We meet at Piney Branch Elementary School, which is on Linton Hall Road in Bristow, and our service times are at 9 and 10.30. If you'd like to find out some more information about the Linton Hall campus, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can check out the church website, newlife.church, and just click on the Linton Hall tab. Or you can check us out on social media. We're on Instagram and Facebook. Simply search for New Life Linton Hall and like and follow to keep up to date on upcoming events and Linton Hall campus news. You can always reach out to us via email. Uh, just send an email to info at newlife.church and we'll reach right back out to you to answer any questions that you have about the Lytton Hall campus. Again, we're so glad you're joining us today. And if you're in the Gainesville, Bristow area, we hope that we get to meet you in person real soon at the Lytton Hall campus. All right, so as we get closer to the start of the service, I do want to highlight two more things. It's really simple. The first thing is communion. If you've not grabbed some grape juice and crackers yet, I would encourage you to do that right now because right after the message, we're going to go into a time of communion where we reflect and remember on the sacrifice that Christ made for us on Good Friday. So grab some grape juice and crackers right now and you can participate in that. But also I want to highlight giving. We believe that giving is a spiritual act of worship and we believe that when we give, we have an opportunity to grow in our faith because let's just be honest, sometimes it's hard to give. Sometimes it's hard to let go of the money that we have and that we've been blessed with. But we believe that we have been blessed by God. And so we want to give back. And not just give back, but give back to what God is doing. See, God is doing amazing things all around the country and in particular around the Northern Virginia area. And when we give, we have the opportunity to be a part of something that we may not have even imagined that we could be a part of. We can be a part of people hearing about Jesus today. And so if you love to give, you can go to newlife.church slash give and you can be part of that and help grow in your faith this year. Again, we are so glad that you're here with us today at New Life Online and we can't wait to worship with you starting right now.
So we have a chance to sing this out. Sing. 
God, we thank you so much that we are free forever because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And God, that he did not stay in the grave, but he left all of our sin, all of our shame like we sang about today. And he rose again with our freedom in his hand. God, those are powerful words and that's a powerful truth that your word is full of. And so, God, would you just speak to us today that we would feel the freedom that comes from Christ. And, God, that we would look to follow you. God, we just ask that you just continue to move in this place today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Y'all haven't won a Super Bowl since I was born. Hey! 
Hey everyone, we're welcome to New Life. That is John Baker, our Good morning, guys. minister. And John. this is Tom Pounder. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, we are so glad you're here. We're wearing jerseys because it's you know football. It's getting ready to football season getting started. Who's who's your favorite team? Yell it out. Okay, good. Not I don't the know. Cowboys. Cowboys, right? Not Wait, who's the your Cowboys. favorite team? I'm a Patriots fan. All Boston, everything. All Boston. Oh, it's the Red Sox. Okay. Yeah, come so on. I mean, playoff blue. season, but the Red, <laughs> Red Sox may not get into the playoffs this year, right? Well, um, Nationals aren't either. So oh, I yeah, that, well, that's <laughs> true, too. Okay, okay. Well, we're glad you're here, and back to school starts this week, right? Parents, cheer. Let's go. Hey! Yeah! Woo! Some of the moms are a little too happy. I saw yeah. a few like, yeah. yeah, I'm happy. I mean, it's good. You know, <laughs> Fairfax starts tomorrow loud and starts on Thursday, so it's good. John, how are, how are the fall looking? The fall is looking great uh, here at New Life. We've got a bunch of stuff starting up. Uh, student ministry, we're hitting the ground running. Uh, we've got a big event next weekend. Uh, and I cannot wait for that. But here at New Life as well, uh, everyone's done traveling, right? School is about to start. Um, so this is the best time for you guys to hop into a life group, start volunteering. Uh, this is the best time here at New Life. Yeah, there's lots of great opportunities. You know, uh, it's a great way to start getting connected. And if you've never filled out a digital connection card, go to newlife.church slash connect. And if you love to serve it, there's great opportunities for you to serve, like student ministry or tech team or children's ministry. There's great opportunities there. Uh, we also have the Exponential DC Conference coming up in September. So if you just go to newlife.church slash serve, or you can go in the back afterwards if you're in Chantilly and talk with Tess. Uh, Brennan would also talk to you about just different opportunities for you to serve. Uh, and uh, again, when you serve, it helps grow your faith. Another thing that we're doing this uh, fall, starting September 1st, we're just finishing up the Heroes in the Bible series uh, where we had a just walk through different heroes in the Bible, and, and we're encouraged by their, um, their lives. But we're doing a thing called Gospel in 90, starting September 1st. So if you text GOSPEL to 703-454-5990, starting September 1st, we're going to send you one chapter a day of the Gospel, and you can be encouraged. We're going to do some video devotionals as well. But it's just a great opportunity for you to grow in your faith. And then also, uh, if you've got, we're going to participate in communion right after the message today. And if you want to grab a communion cup if you haven't already before, grab one now. And if you're online, go and grab some grape juice and crackers. And then finally, I'm going to stop talking in a second and hand it back over to John. <laughs> but finally, hey, uh, and this is not finally, again, there's lots of opportunities for us to grow in our faith. We've been talking about that. But one of those ways is by serving your time, reading the Bible, but also uh, giving back to what God has blessed you with. We've all been blessed in different ways. God has uniquely blessed us. What are you going to do with that, those blessings? Are you going to give it back to what God has given you? Our encouragement, if you'd love to be a part of what God is doing here in New Life and around the world with all our church planting stuff, go to newlife.church. Give today and you can be a part of that. Yeah, and the speaker today is uh, Mr. Buffalo himself. Mr. Buffalo. Big Bills fan. If they don't win the Super Bowl this year, it's going to be a failure of a season. Mr. Burpee is going to be speaking. Mr. Crunches. Mr. Wait, so who is that? I guess we'll have to find out here in a second. It's, it's, we'll find out in a second. But before he gets up here and shares, I do want to encourage you real quick. Uh, write down on your phone or on a piece of paper, I will. And then as our speaker shares today, uh, what will you do based on today's message? That's your encouragement for today. He's going to be up here right after this. Uh, can you just give me a little space here? You just parked a little close. <laughs> guys! Come on, guys! I got a meeting! Never mind. This guy. Stuck between a bad job and a hard place? Uh, Ron, did you, you notice maybe you clipped me a little bit there? Careerbuilder.com. Start building. Ron! I think I gotta sanctify the stage after all that talk of the Dallas Cowboys and the Patriots. Woo, Bills, baby! Yeah, I love that commercial. It's a Super Bowl, Super Bowl commercial, which hoping these guys are gonna be there, okay, in in, in February. But uh, if they're not, okay, I just gotta remember. Before number 17 was throwing touchdowns, we had 17 years of losing seasons, didn't make the playoffs, so 
Just the fact that they've been making the playoffs, I'm happy, okay? But that commercial, perhaps you can relate to it. Like perhaps you can relate to feeling like you work with a bunch of monkeys. I don't know. But I know that one person who could most certainly relate to that commercial was a guy named Adam. Okay, a guy named Adam. We're going to unpack Adam's story today. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And as you do that, let me ask you this question. What was the first crisis in the Bible? What, what was the first crisis in the Bible? I, I asked that to the Adrenaline Boot Camp that I was teaching uh, on Wednesday, and I'd asked them that previously. So I was like, hey, we're quizzing our Bible knowledge again. And does anybody remember, what was the first crisis in the Bible? Somebody said, was it the flood? No, it wasn't the flood. A common response is, was it, you know, was it the apple? You know, was it the fruit? They eaten the, the forbidden fruit. No, it actually wasn't that. Actually, the, the first crisis in the Bible actually came before sin even entered the world, before the fall of man, before everything began to break. We find the first crisis in the Bible in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. But for a little context, let's pick up with the story in verse 15. It says this, So the Lord God took the man, that's Adam, and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so here's God. He has created mankind. He's created Adam. He's created all the animals. He caught, he's got all creation, okay, figured out, and he looks at it, and it's all good, and there's Adam, and I mean, he's living the bachelor life. Okay, it's him and the monkeys. It's him and the animals. I kind of picture him as Tarzan, right? He's kind of just swinging from vine to vine, having a good time. He's got a great job. Wakes up every morning, tends the garden, takes an afternoon, okay, s s swim in the Euphrates. He gets to hike in the evening, stargazes in the night, no, night, no light pollution. Like, could it get any better? Yet even in this paradise, something is missing. Something's not right. So verse 18 says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good for the man to be alone. Everything else was good. He would, God would look at it. That's good. That's good. That's good. All of a sudden he looks at Adam and he says, He's all by himself. This is not good. And this isn't just the conclusion of the Bible. Modern science and Medicine is telling us that it is not good for man to be alone. The Mental Health Foundations a few years ago produced a report called The Lonely Society. In this report, it talks about the detrimental effects on our health that loneliness produces. It says that when we become lonely, when we experience feelings of loneliness, it produces stress hormones that have its mark on our body through lowering our immune systems and hindering our cardiovascular function. That happens when we experience loneliness. It showed a direct connection between loneliness and drug use and sexual promiscuity and anxiety and depression and even paranoia. And if science is showing us that loneliness is actually as detrimental to our health as smoking is. Yeah, it's what led John Orper, the Christian author, to say this, that it's actually better for you to eat Twinkies with good friends than it is for you to eat broccoli alone. That's just, that's just the fact. It's just, it's just true, okay? A guy named Robert Putnam, he's a professor at Harvard, he, he wrote a book called Bowling Alone, in which he talks about the detrimental effects of loneliness. He says that an individual can reduce their risk of dying, their chances of dying in the next year and a half, if they just go from living in isolation to living in community with other people. And so I hate to say it, I hate to say it, but Britney Spears was right that this loneliness is, is killing me. It's true. Literally, loneliness is killing us. You know, Robert Putnam says the best predictor of a person's happiness is the breadth and depth of their social connections. And unfortunately, as a society, we are becoming increasingly more lonely. Cigna Healthcare and Morningstar Research came out with a report last year in 2000. 21, showed that 58% of Americans report feeling lonely, struggle with loneliness, 58%. 79% of young adults ages 18 
to 24 struggle with loneliness. 54% of people said they don't have someone in their life that knows them well. The number of people who don't have any close friends has quadrupled in the last several decades. We're lonely. And, and, it, and it's, it's killing us. It's having these detrimental effects on our health. And why is that? You know, what, what's leading to all this loneliness? Well, one contributing factor is technology, right? Technology is allowing us to live very isolated, independent lives, right? Growing up in Buffalo, New York, I never had a house or an apartment that had air conditioning in it, okay? Thank God for air conditioning. I live down here, okay? But, okay, growing up, you know what we did during the summer when it was really hot? We were outside, right? We were on the front porch looking at all our neighbors connecting, sipping iced tea, playing, playing games, Right now that I have air conditioning, like, I never see my neighbors, right? I got, we got garage door openers that just open up. We get right inside, like, give me the air conditioning. We never have to interact with another human being. On Wednesday night, I got home after teaching a fitness class and walking to my house. I'm walking up the stairs. I don't even get up to the top of my stairs, and I hear the doorbell ring frantically, like, dee, 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 dee. I'm like, oh, it must be one of my neighbors. Like, I've been, I've been building a relationship with them, trying to get to know them. Like, maybe they're, like, ready to talk. And so I, I get to the door. I open it up. What? Look down. There's two pizza boxes there. My roommate Dave comes down. Yeah, those are for me. Oh, okay. They don't even, st- they don't even like, stay anymore? They're like, here's your pizza. Like, no. Like, they don't even ask for a tip. It's like, what? Yeah, we can order food. We can order, do all our shopping. All our necessities just with the click of the button, and we never interact with, interact with another human being, right? Technology is allowing us to live very isolated, independent lives. Another contributing factor is this drive for achievement. Dr. Edward Hollowell, and he's a psychiatrist at Harvard Medical School, he says that achievement is making us more lonely as a society. Where we used to get our identity based upon the groups that we are a part of, We're now getting our identity from our jobs, from how much money we have, the car that we drive, and so it drives us to be more successful, to achieve. And so that motivates us to, you know, uproot ourselves from our support structures, from friends and family, to go to a distant city, to go to the best school, then to to go to this place, to get a best job, to start a career, and instead of setting roots down there and investing in deep relationships, we just say, it's probably not worth it, I'm not going to be here for a long time, and we just throw ourselves into our work and we neglect those relationships that we need, and we become very isolated and more lonely. So why modern countries like Japan, even in the United States, you can rent a friend. Like, it is a, it is a industry. In Japan, you can rent a companion, you can rent a, a, a wife, a husband, not to do anything like you shouldn't be doing, just to have someone to play checkers with, just somebody that can, you know, talk with you because we're lonely and we know we need companionship. This is why Mother Teresa once said that loneliness is the modern-day leprosy. So loneliness is the modern-day leprosy, and nobody wants other people to know that they're a leper. Several weeks ago, I was watching the PBS NewsHour. Yes, I watched the PBS NewsHour, okay, you know. I am a bit of a nerd. I'm not a communist, okay, but I, I love the PBS NewsHour, okay? And on, on Friday nights, on Friday nights, David Brooks from the New York Times gives this, like, social commentary, and this was right after all the mass shootings that had taken place in Buffalo and Chicago and Uvalde, and they said, David, like, what's up? Like, why are we seeing all of these mass shootings? And he said, well, if, if 54% of us, like, don't have a close friend, if we don't have people that we can share our deepest, darkest secrets with, like, what do you expect? We're going to become less than human. We're going to commit acts of violence like we're animals. You know, what is he saying? He is saying it is not good for man to be alone. That is the problem. What's the solution? Well, the Bible gives us the solution as we continue reading. Verse 19 says this, So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal, every bird of the sky, and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. Or as some translations say, that not not a suitable helper was found. So, So what's going on here? 
Look, Adam's not just naming the animals. He is looking for a helpmate, okay? He is looking for a helpmate, and, right? I, 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 I'm a single person. I know a lot of single people. Today, they're just like, you know, like, like finding a person, like finding a helpmate. It's just so hard, so difficult these days. So you've, you've gone online, right? You've gone online. You're just like, what does the app not understand? Like, why do they keep matching me with this person that lives 60 miles away and is 10 years older than me? Like, you think you have it rough? Adam's getting matched with Lucy the buffalo from the D.C. Zoo. Like, who's swiping right on her? Like, it ain't happening. Okay, it's a struggle, right? It's like, I know, okay, God, I understand. Chetna the cheetah, she's really fast, okay? Yeah, it's pretty cool. But conversations go nowhere, okay? Like, there's no chemistry here. No sparks are flying, God. Help me out. Well, he does. He does. Story continues saying this, verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. And God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. All of a sudden, right, Adam sees Eve, and he's like, whoa, man, right? This is amazing. Wow, God, thank you for hooking me up. This is, she's definitely a lot better than the monkeys. Like, whoo, a lot easier on the eyes. And all of a sudden, now he's got, like, someone that he can relate to, like, the same level. Like, we can have conversation. We can have these shared experiences. And all of a sudden, he has this connection with another soul that he desperately needed, he desperately longed for, even though he might not even knew it. And all of a sudden, this need that he has is, is being met. So the verse continues, the story continues saying this, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife. They connect and they become one flesh. They become one flesh. They become husband and wife. Now, before all the single people in the room and online are just like, I knew it, right? I knew it. That's my problem, right? That is my problem. I am lonely because I'm single, Right? If only I get married, if only I was married, then I wouldn't be lonely anymore. Married people, how's that working out for you? Okay, okay. You know, a lot of times, you know, most of the times people who are up here, they're married, and they get to talk, you know, give great marriage advice. I'm going to give some advice for single people, right? I'm a, I'm a single guy. I love being single. So let's think about it, single people. How do we be content as a single person? You got to stop focusing on what you don't have and focus on, on what you do have. Like all the time I hear my friends are like, oh, woe is me. Like I'm the only one of my friends that's still single, right? Always a groomsman, never a groom. You know, I actually never hear that, but I hear it on the other side, okay? Um, but it's like, yeah, it's amazing. Like I, I don't have to do any of the work. I just get to show up for the party. Like it's awesome, okay? But you're always so, oftentimes just so focused on what we don't have instead of focusing on what we do have. If you're single, okay, maybe, you know, single parents, maybe this doesn't always apply to you, but single, no kids, what do you have? Think about this. What do you have? Let me sum it up in one word. Freedom, okay? (laughs) Freedom, right? Okay, just think about all the decisions that you get to make unilaterally. You don't got to run any of this stuff by anybody else. Like, like where are you going to go to lunch today after church? Wherever you want to go to lunch, right? You want to go to Taco Bell? You're going to go to Taco Bell, right? When are you going to go on vacation? Whenever you want to go on vacation, wherever you want to go. Don't got to, you know, run it by anybody. Does Billy have soccer? I don't, you can, your friends call you up. Hey, you want to hang out? Yeah, I'll be right there, right? You don't have to run it by. Last, yesterday, yesterday about 4 p.m., you guys, hey, we're going hiking. You want to come? Yeah, I'll be right there. Got to go hiking with some friends. It was awesome. But oftentimes we're so focused on what we don't have that we think, you know, we're second-class citizens of single people. And yet 1 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul says, hey, all you single people out there, he says, hey, if you, can, you know, if you can remain pure sexually, it would actually be better for you to just stay single. Okay, just stay single. He says, because you know what you do when you get married? He says, you invite trouble into your life. Okay, 1 Corinthians 7, 28. Okay, he says, you're going to face a lot of trouble. I just want to save you that heartbreak. Okay, just, I just want to save you from that. He says, as single people, your attention is undivided. You get to serve God, okay? You're just, whoo, single-minded. You know, you start having a family, starting kids, you know, whoo, you split in all these different directions. There are so many benefits of being single, but so oftentimes, okay, we're just like not focused on that. So if you are single, if you are single, take advantage of your single years, right? You, you've got a little more time. You've got more flexibility in your schedule. 
Have fun. Go on weekend excursions. Join the team of people that are going to Israel. Okay, you're going to go see the Holy Land. You might not have an opportunity to see it another time. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of your time by serving, investing in the kids through serving in kids' zone. Be a mentor to the students in our student ministry. Serve people that are transitioning out of homelessness into permanent housing through our Passion for Community ministry. You know, as single people, I'll admit it, we've got a little extra cash to spend, right? You can live with a roommate, have a little extra cash to spend. You can support a child through Compassion International and go and visit them. You have the freedom to do it. Take advantage of it, right? I know the temptation for single people is just to look at all their married friends and be like, oh, man, if only I had that. And you know what the married people are looking at you thinking? Right? You're like, oh, man, what I wouldn't give to be single. Guy. I didn't know what I had until I, I lost it. It's true, right? Every, every once in a while, you're kind of like, there are some perks of being single. If you're single, don't see it as a curse. See it like the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 as a gift. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 19, marriage is hard. He says marriage is hard and, and, and divorce isn't an option. He says, so if, if you can stay single, just stay single. He says, some people have made eunuchs. They've been forced to be single so they can serve in a king's court. He says, other people choose to be single so they can serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. They've been made eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. If you're single, take advantage of your single year. Serve God. Take advantage of that freedom that you have. Because don't, don't, don't think, okay, you know, once I get married, then I won't be lonely again. You know, don't think I just need to find that other person to complete me because that person won't complete you. The only person that can complete you is Jesus. And when you learn to invest in your relationship with him and he's the one that completes you, hey, now you're in a good position to be able to give and to receive love and not be in a codependent relationship. So work on that now as you're single. Put you in a good position. Now, you know, married people, okay, okay, you find yourself in a relationship, you find yourself Married, and yet sometimes you still struggle with loneliness. Why is that? Why is that? Well, it's because that loneliness, it occurs when we have a a relational need or a relational expectation that isn't being met, right? We, we, We have these needs, we have these expectations, and we're just not getting it from this relationship. But one thing I want to think about, I want us to wrestle with is, but why? You know, where did this need come from? Where it's not like someone's starving us of food, it's not like someone's starving us of water. It's not like we're not getting sleep. And okay, that, you know, it's like, how could, why is loneliness so detrimental? Like, what, what is the deal? Well, the reason why we have these relational needs is because we've been created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 puts it this way. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so when God created man, unlike when he was creating animals, it, it was a team effort. God, God said, hey, Father, Son, Holy Spirit says, let's create something special, humanity. And, and the pronouns there are plural, us, ours. Why? Because Father, Son, Holy Spirit had forever existed in eternal community, relation, relationship with one another. And so we have been created in the image of a relational God, and so we are relational beings. Right? We, we have been made for connection. We need connection. We need relationships. And when those needs aren't being met, we experience loneliness. Yes, we experience loneliness. You know, this is one of the reasons why pickleball, right? Pickleball is becoming such a popular sport. It's the fastest growing sport, the most popular sport that's growing, okay, in America. My parents love pickleball, right? My dad's got this app that shows him all the diff- different places and all the different games that are going on throughout Buffalo. You know, I go up and visit them. I play with like, hey, Dad, hey, Sean, when do you want to play? You want to play in the morning, 6 a.m.? You want to play at 8? You want to play at 10? You want to play at 12? We can go play with the Browns over there. Okay, we can play with, we can play with Richard. You know he's a retired mail carrier? No, I didn't know that, Dad. Okay, great. <laughs> it's like, like some people, okay, maybe my dad, okay, some people are like, you know, I play pickleball for the exercise. Who you kidding? Okay. Mmm. Mmm. Mm, it's like exercise. You, you, okay, like if you want a good wrist exercise, okay, go play pickleball, okay? If you want a good exercise, okay, you want to meet some new people, come join CrossFit Hydraulic, okay? We will give you a good exercise. You'll meet some new people. We got plenty of space. 
You know, one of the reasons why these different gyms, the new, the new tr- uh, trend, the new fad in fitness, are all group fitness places. F45, Burn Boot Camp, Orange Theory, Red Effect. They're all places where you go, not to work out by yourself, but to work out with other people, right? Because we're relational beings and we need this connection. And so that's why the text continues saying this, verse 25. Hey, both the man and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. Both the man and his wife were naked and they felt no shame. Here is the solution. Here's the solution to our loneliness. Here's the cure. You don't want, you don't want to know what the cure to your loneliness is? Here it is. Get naked. Okay, that, that is it. That's the solution. Get naked. Okay, now that I have the attention of all the middle school boys, okay, <laughs> let me explain what I mean by get naked. Okay, I don't mean like, you know, stripping your clothes off and going streaking or birds with beats. Okay, I don't mean any of that. I mean being vulnerable with other people. I mean being open and honest. I mean having some people in your life that you're saying, I don't need to hide. Right? I don't need to hide in this guilt and the shame that I'm feeling. I can be open. I, I can share with some people some of my deepest, darkest secrets, some of my burdens that I'm carrying. I can share some of the highs and the lows and celebrate recovery. We talk about balancing our inventory, you know, the things that we're sharing with the highs and the lows. We need people who we can mourn with and people who can mourn with us and people who can rejoice with us and people who we can rejoice with. But that's going to mean we've got to be vulnerable. We've got to get naked. But some of us, we, well, whew, we push away from that. We're not ready for that yet, yet because what, maybe when we were kids, we needed that vulnerability, we needed that love, we needed that emotional support in a relationship we had, but we were kind of neglected. And, and so now we kind of keep everything really close to our chest. And some of us, we, we struggle with vulnerability because we were vulnerable with someone, we trusted somebody, and they betrayed our trust. They shared it with some confidential information, and so now we're just like, I don't, I don't know if I can risk that hurt any longer. You know, some of us, we've, we've shared some excitement with somebody. They weren't excited with us. We're like, what? Or we, we pursued a relationship and it didn't work out. And so now, well, we're just not sure if it's worth it any longer. And so, you know, some of us have retreated to social media to bear our souls. We, we've retreated to our, our thousands of friends on Facebook to share the exciting things that are going on in our lives, the vacations, the promotions, but also our lows, the health difficulties, the prayer requests, the bad things. But does that ever really lead to long-term healing or satisfaction? Oftentimes it doesn't. I think Proverbs 18, 24 is very prophetic. It's spoken thousands of years ago, speaking to our time today, saying this, one with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. You know, some of us think if we can just share it with thousands of people, superficial relationships that we have online, then things will be better. But does it get better? Not oftentimes. We probably don't, we usually don't get the reaction we're hoping for. Oftentimes people share things and we're like, I didn't want to hear that. It's not leading to satisfaction to great relationships. Oftentimes leads to great harm. I love how Craig Rochelle puts it. He says, social media, the drug that sells the illusion of intimacy, but leaves us drowning in comparisons and craving real relationships. Craving to have a brother, a sister, a close friend that we can bear our souls with. I, I'll admit that growing up, my brother and I weren't very close. It's kind of like Adam and the monkeys, like uh, there was just a different, like he was 11 years younger than me, okay? So I was playing sports and he was playing with blocks and watching Veggie Tales, okay? Different levels. But now that we've grown up and he's a young adult and I'm a don't know what I am at this point, okay, you know, kind of lost child, 36-year-old, single guy, whatever, okay. It's like now, now we can do like adult things together and have like grown-up conversations and we're bonding, we're having fun. And well, right before the pandemic, he starts sending me videos of people who are doing this whole van life thing, okay. I don't know if you've seen people who do van life, you know, they sell all their possessions, you know, they sell the house that they're living in, they move everything into a van. Okay, I don't think many of them actually owned a house, but, you know, they sell everything that they have and they, you know, move everything they have into a van. They just travel the country and they work whenever they need to work. And it's just like, as a single person, it's like, man, that's, that looks pretty awesome. Like, kind of tempted to do that. 
No, and, and it kind of reminded me of the story of Christopher McCandless, who grew up right here in northern Virginia. His story is chronicled in the best-selling novel, Into the Wild, written by author John Krakauer, made into a movie. Yes, Christopher McCandless, he went to Woodson High School in Fairfax, went to a college in Atlanta, came back here, got a great job, was making tons of money, but he wasn't happy. He was saying, there's some, some, there's some disconnect. Like, I'm lonely, I'm not happy. All this money, all these possessions isn't providing me the life that I thought it would give me. He says, what's wrong? He says, I, I know the solution. I need to sell everything. I need to give my money away. So that's what he does. He says, I need to go out west and find myself. And so he goes out west and he starts traveling up and down the west coast to find himself, to find happiness. But he doesn't ever find happiness. And so he says, oh, okay, what, the, what the, I really need to do is I need to get away from all human contact, all of society. Stop listening to the lies and just go and be by myself. Then I'll be happy. And so he travels all the way up to the Alaskan wilderness. There he finds this abandoned school bus to live in. Fortunately, he doesn't make it very long. He dies. We just don't know exactly how he died. Maybe some poisonous berries, maybe the loneliness. We don't know. But when his body was found, it was found with books that he was reading. And in those books, he was highlighting and underlining phrases that emphasized the need for human connection. And in his journal, just shortly before he passed away, he penned these words. He said that happiness, he said happiness is only real when shared. Yeah, unfortunately, he learned that lesson a little bit too late. I hope it is not too late for us. That it's not good for man to be alone. Yes, that's why John, the disciple who described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, this disciple who experienced this intimate friendship with Jesus, he tells us this, 1 John 4, 7, he says, friends, followers of Jesus, let us love one another because love comes from God. A few verses later in verse 12, he says that no one's ever seen God. But if we love one another, he remains in us and his love is made complete in us. What is John saying? He's saying our souls will always be restless until they rest in the love of our Heavenly Father. How do we experience that love? John says, no one's ever seen God. Like he's a spirit. And so even though we want to wrap our arms around him and give him a hug and feel his embrace, like that can't happen. But what can happen? We can embrace a brother or sister in Christ. And we can share our hurts and our hang-ups with our brothers and sisters in Christ and hear them say, me too. I'm struggling too. We can love one another sacrificially. And in that way, we get to experience a bit of who God is because, as John said, that God is love. You know, this word one another, translated one another, love one another, it's found a hundred different times in the New Testament. A hundred different times. Why do we see so many commands in the New Testament of one another, love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, encourage one another, bear one another's burdens? It's because, friends, our faith, our relationship with God, it's personal, but it's not individualistic. It's personal, but it's not individualistic. We've got to be able to be in community with other people in order to obey these commands. Like, how are we going to grow in patience if we don't have people that are going to test our patience? How, how can we learn to forgive those who have hurt us if we don't have people around to forgive? How are we going to become more like Jesus if we don't have people sharpening us like the book of Proverbs tells us is possible? Even the French novelist Stendhal put it this way. He says, one can acquire everything in solitude except character. Yet we need other people to build us up, other people to challenge us, other people to help us become more like Jesus. You know, I hope that you don't come to church thinking, hey, I'm checking the box, right? Church is a service that I go to once a week so I can, you know, go and grow in my relationship with God. Certainly that's part of it, but the church is not a service to attend. It's a community of faith to be a part of. It's a spiritual family, right? It's easy to come to church on a Sunday morning, to walk through the doors, to sit down, worship, sing some songs, Try not to fall asleep during the message, okay, right? Take communion, leave, and not have anybody mention your name. 
right? It's very easy to do that. It's easy to remain anonymous when you just come to a service and not have any of your relational, social needs met. And you're missing out on what church has intended to be, what Jesus died to create His body of Christ to be. And so if you're not part of a small group, if, you, if you're not a, in, a, in a community of people where people know your name and, and you have some people that you can share your deepest, darkest secrets with, you can, you can share some of the ways that you're experiencing joy this week, could I encourage you? Get involved in a small group. Get involved in a small group. Find tests in the back and say, hey, how do I get connected in a small group? You know, mothers of preschoolers, I don't know if there's any mothers of preschoolers here today. But according to my research, you are some of the most loneliest people in our society, right? You're at maybe a new stage in life, and you're at home a lot inside taking care of your kids, and man, you don't get a lot of interaction with other adults. You desperately need a group to be a part of, and that's why we have MOPS, Mothers of Preschools. We got a new group starting next month in September, and they would love for you to be a part of that group. If you're online, reach out to your chat host. Say, how do I get connected to MOPS? If you're here, go in the back. Say, Tess, how do I get connected to this group? I need this group. I need this connection. You know, I, I hope you have hope that you don't have to live in your loneliness any longer. Because as followers of Jesus, we have that hope. Now, I, I know that not only because of, you know, my life and the community that I have and the relationships that I have, but I know it because when Jesus died on the cross, do you know what he experienced? He experienced loneliness. He, he experienced vulnerability. He was stripped naked so that we can be naked and we can be vulnerable and we don't have to be lonely anymore. When he died on the cross, he yelled out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Because for once in all of eternity, the harmony that he shared with his heavenly Father began to tear. It was severed. But he went through that so that our relationship with God could be restored, but also our relationship with other people could be restored. Not only were our sins that divide us from God paid for at the cross, the sins that put up barriers between us and other people were paid for. See, the thing that oftentimes hinder us from being in deep, vulnerable relationships is hurts. It's sin. But because we can say, hey, I've been forgiven, I can forgive this other person. Because I can be forgiven, I have this love, my identity isn't found in my relationship with other person. I can be open, I can be vulnerable. I don't have to be in this codependent relationship because my identity is found in Christ and His love for me. That gives you the confidence to be vulnerable, to get naked. You know, the reason why we can live in cities surrounded by millions of people the reason why college students have been, just been moving into dorms, and they're going to be surrounded by their peers. We live in neighborhoods. We live in houses surrounded by other people, but we're still going to be experience loneliness is because proximity to other people doesn't cure loneliness. Vulnerability does. Vulnerability does. And the way that we can be vulnerable has been paid for at the cross. When Jesus became lonely, when He became vulnerable for our sake. So maybe this is your I will statement this week. I will sacrifice spending time in front of a screen, watching TV, watching Netflix, being on social media, and reach out to a friend. Reach out to a family member, go get coffee, have a meal together, and just share. Right? Share what's bringing you joy this week. What can we celebrate together? Share what burdens are you carrying? What's keeping you up at night? What is stressing you out? Share that. Listen to one another. And then pray with one another. Don't say, I'll pray for you later. I'll pray for you later. Pray in that moment. Be open, be vulnerable in that moment before you and God, and you'll experience a connection which you cannot experience anywhere else. Do that and watch your loneliness begin to dissipate. Friends, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be difficult. But boy, it's going to be worth it. Let me pray for us and ask God to help us take that next step this week. Let's go him in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that because of what your son Jesus did for us on the cross, that we don't have to live in our loneliness anymore. I thank you for the fact that I know that I am never lonely. I, I thank you for the fact that I am never on my own because you are always with me. 
God, I thank you for my friends here at New Life Christian Church. I thank you for the community, the family that I have, the support that we can partake in. But God, I pray that you would give us the confidence to be vulnerable with one another. Just a few people, God, give us some names right now to reach out to. Through one another, we would experience healing, God. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. It's at this time in our gathering when we we come around a table. You know, in the early church, they didn't hand out cups like this for communion. They actually literally got around a table and broke the same loaf together and they drank of the same cup together, experiencing an intimate fellowship because that's what communion is intended to be. We, we celebrate our relationship with God has been restored through the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. But horizontally, we celebrate the friends, the new family that we're a part of that we get to share this meal together with. And it wasn't something that was easily gained, something that brought enemies together. People that were always rivals would gather around this table and would eat of this meal that unites us, communion. So in the next few moments, I want you to reflect upon Jesus' body give, nailed to a cross, His flesh that was torn, His blood that was poured out to not only tell you who you are, to tell you that your identity is found in His love, but to also tell you that you've been adopted into a family, into a family where you don't have to be lonely anymore. Jesus, the Bible says, has come like a brother to us. Spend some time with him, reflect, pray. When you're ready, take of this meal together. I'll wrap us up with a word of prayer, and then we'll continue our worship through singing. Let's take and let's eat. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we come before you and, man, we just reach out to you as our Heavenly Father. We ask that you would be our Father today. We ask that you would bind us together with brothers and sisters. We pray that you would fill us up with your love so we can love other people. We can, we can be known, we can know other people, and we can shine brightly in a dark world, a, a world that desperately needs your love, needs your joy, needs your peace. God, use us to be harbingers of that kingdom, this new family. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing together. Let's use this time to Ask God to draw us closer to him, to teach us how to be present with him, how to depend on him. For my way 
taking breath for my daily breath. I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to rise for my sleep. I depend on you, I depend on you, you're the way, the truth, and the life, you're the well that never runs dry, I'm the branch and you are the vine, draw me close and teach me to abide. Where the Spirit leads, as I'm following, I depend on you, I depend on you for the victories still in front of I depend on you, oh, you're the way, the truth, and the light, you're the well that never runs dry, I'm the branch and you are the vine, draw me close and teach me to abide, give my strength, my soul in the night, be my What a great song to end our service today. So the question is, what will you do because of what you heard today? My encouragement is do not leave here today until you've decided that, or do not turn off your computer until you decide what you're going to do. I can tell you this, when I was single, this spoke to me when Sean was sharing, uh, just when I was single, I just kept on wishing my life away and thinking, if only I was married, my life would be complete. And then it was, if only I had a kid, my life would be complete. I wished my life away, and I didn't embrace who God created me to be. And God has a plan for you, 
and God wants you to be in community. And that's where we can grow in our faith and be stretched in great ways. So if you'd love to learn more about that, Tess is in the back. Uh, uh, a few other people are in the back and Dale's in the back as well. Uh, but it, also, if you're online, email us, info at newlife.church. We would love to connect you with the group today. It's a great experience for you and your entire family. Hey, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for today. and Thank you for uh, what you shared with us today. Uh, and so, Lord, I thank you for the worship, the message, uh, and the encouragement we got. And I pray, Lord, that as we process what's happening uh, this coming year, with the start of a new school year right around the corner, that you would help us get connected, uh, get connected for ourselves, get connected for our families, uh, and that this would be a great uh, year for us uh, to grow in our faith and grow in community. And Lord, I just pray that as we're starting the school year uh, this week, it's a, an exciting time, but it's also a stressful time. There's a lot of anxiety as well associated with it. So give us peace. Guide us and direct us as we go about a new school year this year. Uh, lead us to where you need us to be, as, again, as individuals and as a family. Lord, we thank you and we praise your name. It's your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.